From falling in love with the United States to falling in love for the first time here in the States, we're introducing you to first generation stories that not only paved the road for themselves, but others after them. The Whitney Reynolds Show is supported by the Illinois chapter of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, whose mission is to save lives and bring hope to those affected by suicide. Children's Learning Place, excellence in early childhood education since 1998. Evolve Her, a collaborative workspace for women. Kevin Kelly with Jameson Sotheby's International Realty. Luxury is an experience, not a price point. The Jay Parker, a Chicago rooftop restaurant at the Hotel Lincoln. And Hollis Plyman and Company, a Jacksonville CPA firm assisting individuals and businesses with financial success. Special thanks to Dr. Daftari and the team at Arta Modern Dentistry. Cellular Intelligence. Goldfish Swim Schools of Chicagoland. Deluxe Cleaning Services. Ega Salon and Spa. Chicago Andrea Creative and Export Fitness. When is the last time you can remember trying or doing something for the first time? Well, for today's guests, they are first generations of all sorts, here to share their stories of blazing the trail for themselves and others to come. We're talking first generation. You're watching The Whitney Reynolds Show. Our first guest fell literally in love with and in the States. Jackie and her husband Juan's love story began after coming from Mexico. However, their first generation story doesn't stop there. Let's take a look. The conversation always goes back to without each other, our life would not be as amazing as it is. We couldn't make it happen without each other. It's finally time to create a book with the word that we've been living since we got married. We came to this country with nothing and uh, somehow we have a trip or, or American dream, I guess. We have a great lifestyle. It has some NEC. Anybody can do it. Anybody can do it, including you. You can achieve your dreams. Welcome to the show, Jackie. Thank you. Such an honor to be here. So we just saw the video of you and your husband and you literally fell in love in the States. Yes. And what the coincidence is that we both are first generation here in the United States and we both arrived the same year. That is wild. And so you, how close were your towns in Mexico? 45 minutes apart. 45. We would have never, ever met in Mexico. I love that. <laughs> and today's show is all about being first generation. And what does that mean to you? I think for me, first of anything means to be somebody that believes that there's some force within you to make a change and to be a trailblazer, to pave the way for those that come after you, to believe in something that is greater than you. And to me, there's so many beautiful words and this beautiful combination of things that make you the first of anything, the first of something. Was it hard to leave Mexico and come to the United States? It was very hard. It was very hard, especially at 14. I, I had no command of the English language. I, my friends were obviously there, and uh, it was extremely difficult to, to adjust to this new life. And you came on a visa, and coming here at such a young age, your mom actually is back in Mexico now. Yes. What was that like for you? It was very hard, especially because it was after I had um, gone through a couple of incidents with cancer, mm -hmm. and um, she had to go back to Mexico to take care of my grandma. And uh, she now has been living there for the last 12 years. And it's been really hard, especially the first three to four years to be here when we came here as a family. Right. And all of a sudden to see her go back and to be alone, you know, with, you know, my two brothers, they were already married and they were, you know, just uh, with their own life, but um, just reinventing myself. 
without my mom. Well, it was and, really hard. And that's kind of one of the concepts of being a first generation, you're paving the way, but that doesn't mean it's easy at all. And even whenever you're getting to where you're going, that doesn't mean it's going to be easy when you get there. Absolutely. And I think that um, a lot of us that are coming here to the United States, we tend to find comfort in our own culture. Mm -hmm. And that is phenomenal. That is wonderful. But at the same time, it creates this area of comfort that does not allow you to dream bigger and really pave the way for other people. So I have found this beautiful combination, this fusion between retaining who I am as a first generation Mexican in the United States and also embracing the culture, this mm -hmm. pragma pragmatic culture with the passion. And, and that's how I've kind of paved my way over the last uh, 22 years. With everything that's been going on lately that we've seen with immigration, where do you, I don't want to say stand with that, but what would you say to your fellow Latinas or other, you know, young women, young men that want to come over? Because, I mean, you did do all the steps properly. Yeah, I think that, you know, doing that, I think that finding where you fit in the space and if the United States is a place that you want to be, then embrace it. Or if you want to go to Europe or if you want to go anywhere in the world, you have to understand that in order to fully live and exist and serve the community, you have to be part of the community. You mm. have to breathe like the community. You have to do what the Romans do. And mm. I think that, um, you know, this is an amazing opportunity for us as immigrants to continue to show and, and basically showcase the beauty that we have and how we can add to the beautiful fabric of the United States. Well, and that's what the United States is all about is, um, I mean, we're all immigrants if you think back to our history of coming here. So, your entrepreneurship also is a first-generation story. <laughs> At 23, I started my marketing agency. Now, keep in mind that I didn't speak a word of English when I came. I was 14. At 23, I created a marketing communications company in English, which I didn't even speak a few years prior to that. You know, to do that, and what I was saying before, is like it just takes a lot of guts, a lot mm -hmm. of belief, a lot of love, for yourself and in your community and your people and just thinking, how can my actions elevate other people? Well, and that is incredible because like you were saying, you didn't even speak the language <laughs> and then you start this marketing firm. How did you go from A to B? Because the show is not just on immigration today. It's not just being first generation American. It's trying stuff for the first time. So how did you do that? I think I just believed that I can add value. I mean, the essence of anyone growing and expanding is the value that you can encapsulate is your intellectual property or your, you know, your, your knowledge and how that serves other people. And I think that even though people around me would say, well, you're not ready, you're so young, who are you? I believed that I had value to offer to the world. And that was my confidence to go out and make it happen. That's amazing. And so you're saying a lot of this first ump came from within yes. you first. Absolutely. Oh. Comes from a divine download, as I call them. <laughs> I love that. Divine download. You just, you hear it, you do it, you believe it and do it. And you make it happen and manifest. And many times it actually shows up in ways that you never even imagined. Mm. You know, I never thought that when I published my first book at 26, it was going to lead me to another 10 books at 35. I never thought that I would be able to fly a plane on my own with my teddy bear. And now, you know, after July 7th uh, of this year to carry passengers. Wow. You know, and it takes a lot of, a lot of guts. So your first generation story is not stopping. Thank you so much, Jackie, for coming on the show. Thank you so much. What an honor. She's a familiar face to TV, but as we'll learn, there's much more to her smile, love for cooking, and the recipes she shares. Lydia Bastianich joins us now with more. Lydia, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Whitney. Yes, I'm so honored that you're here because I feel like we're in the presence of just a mastermind when it comes to cooking. Well, thank you. Thank you for all that uh, buildup. I just love it. I have a good time. So your first generation journey, I mean, I was, I've been catching up on kind of where everything started for you. Tell us about what it was like coming over to America. I came as an immigrant at 12 years old. My story is that I was born in Istria. Istria is a little peninsula. If you look at Italy in the right-hand corner, right across from Venice, across that sea there, uh, is Istria, and that was all Italy. 
Uh, after World War II, Italy lost the war. Uh, the border went down, and that part of Italy was given to the newly formed communist Yugoslavia. So we were caught behind the Iron Curtain. And I was just born at the time. And it was quite difficult because as uh, ethnic Italians, we couldn't speak Italian, we couldn't go to church. You know, we were kind of uh, oppressed in many ways. Uh, my father had a little trucking business. Uh, he was deemed a capitalist, put in jail. And, uh, you know, it was, was a, a, bit, a bit difficult. And uh, in 1956, uh, uh, my parents decided that maybe it was time to move on. Wow, that is an amazing story. And, you know, people might not know that. Sometimes, you know, whenever, whenever we do what we do for work, people just see us as what we are. And it's amazing the story that brought you here and brought you even into the kitchen. Yes, you yes. You know, I always thought that everybody's interested in my cooking, in my recipes. But it seems that, you know, people want to know more yeah. about the person. And there were so many people that helped us along to find a home, to find a job. Wow. They, they, you know, people brought, uh, I mean, you know, I get emotional because uh, the, the goodness that exists in America, okay. uh, they, they brought us chairs, uh, mm -hmm. tables, food and everything. And we got our way. See, and, and, that, and here I am. That makes me happy to hear. Like as um, someone that was born in America, sometimes we take what we have for granted. Like you forget what one person's journey to this wonderful country might have looked like. Exactly. Whitney, and that's part of why I really feel good about this book, because I'm sharing my experiences. And, you know, if, if I made it, anybody can make it. There's such great opportunities here in America, and America is so given. And sometimes when I hear, you know, being malign, America being maligned, it kind of hurts me because it's so natural. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. And you're right, America, this is a, a country where we can dream and live out our dreams. So you have the book. You're doing so much. Explain where you are Well, today. I love cooking. You know, with all my restaurants and uh, certainly here, uh, I'm involved with Italy. Oh. And uh, yes, we have among all the different restaurants and you know, it's food, 300, Italian food, 360 degrees. But we have La Scuola. Mm -hmm. And La Scuola is because we want to also, um, you might consider coming for a class. <laughs> if I don't burn the place down. No, you won't. <laughs> and so I am the dean of La Scuola in all of the Italy's and set up the classes and sharing with the uh, people, with our guests, uh, the cooking mm. uh, elements of Italian food. Well, you are so amazing. Thank you for sharing your story with us today. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you for having me. First generation college grad. Now that's something you can tip or throw your hat to. We sat down with Chicago City Clerk Anna Valencia to hear about her courage for college. Welcome to the show, Anna. So your first generation story is super unique because we're talking college. Yes. Well, thank you for having me, first of all. I'm happy to be here to tell my story. But I know that a lot of young people, especially in Chicago, have very similar stories about being first in their families to go to college. Um, even listening to Michelle Obama's new story, she talks about her experience at Princeton and what that was like being a minority and being first in her family also to be at school. So let's go back to your younger years. Okay. When you were a little kid, was college on the radar? Was it something you yes. talked about? Okay. Yeah. So it was on the radar. What was it that made you say, I'm going to do this? So really it was my parents. So my dad is a union painter and my mom worked at a nonprofit and neither of them had their college degree. And so from a very young age, I just remember my father, like, you're going to college, you're going to college, you're going to college. And no one really knew what that meant, right? Mm -hmm. You say the words, but no one understands ex exactly the process. And it was actually a high school teacher that saw potential in me that really helped my mom and I understand what that meant, how to apply and where and why. And so I actually had this thought that I wanted to go to Notre Dame. I was a good Catholic girl and thought Notre Dame was the place to go. Unfortunately, I had a counselor, a high school counselor, who said that I wouldn't get in. Mm. So I didn't even apply. I did not apply. That's one regret I have. I never knew if I would actually get in, but I didn't apply. But thankfully, I had that teacher step in and tell me that she thought I was special and that I could should go away to college. And so she really helped me apply to school. Do you think if you wouldn't have had that teacher in that right moment that maybe you would have hung up your cap after you were told no, 
you won't get into Notre Dame, do you think you would have said goodbye to college? You know, I think I would have always gone, but I think I would have shortchanged myself because mm. there was a local community college that a lot of high school students from my hometown would go to or a nearby college. And that was fine and great for them, but I was actually first in my family and my cousins to actually leave and go three hours away to U of I. In fact, I only applied to three schools that were three hours away from my home because I was a little apprehensive and afraid what that meant. And I remember walking onto U of I's campus that summer. Uh, my mom and I went to orientation, and I had a three-day orientation where the rest of the body had two-day orientation. But the minority students had three days because they wanted to help us find the library and how to get to classes. And, and I even had a, a counselor when I got to college to help me stay on track with my grades. So I got a little extra help, but I'm so happy because when I walked onto that campus, it was huge. Yeah. You know, you're talking 40,000 people, undergrad students, that was bigger than my hometown. Mm -hmm. So it can be very overwhelming when you're coming from you know, a middle class family, lower middle class family into this huge place of prestige. Well, and that's where I wanna go because not only did you change the path for yourself because you went to college, you graduated, but now you're changing it for other mm -hmm. young people after you, which is one of the most amazing things about being a first generation because you wanna help others yes, there too. So tell really us do. about some of the stuff you've done. So I met Chicago scholars actually three months into dating my now husband and I convinced him to mentor with me. And we have seen the most amazing, extraordinary students come out of this program. In fact, my very first girl, Shikari, uh, she's now a Teach for America alum. She's working in Oklahoma City, but she grew up here in Chicago. She went to U of I. She was first in her family to go to college as well. And she's now applying for her PhD at Stanford. Oh, and then I have Daniela, that. who is undocumented, came here from Ecuador with her mother, went to Lincoln Park High School, graduated, actually went to Elmhurst, but really had her sights on Georgetown, saved up enough money, applied, got a full ride to Georgetown, just graduated, and at 24 years old, she was just listed in Forbes 30 Under 30. Yes! And she started her own accelerator to save the oceans of ocean sustainable products and had a million dollars invested. And she's 24 yes. from Chicago. Mm, and that's I what that. I love. So it gives me more than I could ever you know, think or imagine of the fulfillment of me sharing my experience of what I went through and being able to help these young women, young women of color, succeed into college and beyond. Well, thank you so much for coming on and telling us how you got from A to B and what do you want to leave any young person out there or person that there's no age limit on college. Yes. So what do you want to leave people with about being a first generation college grad? Be fearless and also don't let anyone tell you no or get in your way of to your goal. Love that. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Whitney. It's now time for our viewer's voice where we take it to you on the street. And we asked this week, what have you tried for the first time? I had a unique experience. I was flying from St. Louis to Chicago on Ozark Airlines and the flight attendant asked me if I wanted to do the flight demo and I did it. I was the first Mongolian to graduate from Purdue University of Indiana with a degree. Get social with us. Make your voice heard. Submit your video on WhitneyReynolds.com. Title IX changed a lot, and for our next guest, created her first generation story. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So we're talking first generations, and you're a first generation basketball player. Yeah. Now tell us what that means to you. Well, I was born in 1972, which is the year that Title IX was passed. So I kind of see myself as a Title IX baby. Well, and, and for our viewers that don't really understand Title IX, how did that impact you directly? Well, before Title IX, there weren't a lot of opportunities for women in sports. Uh, for instance, my mom really didn't have any opportunities to play sports in her high school, in her middle school. It was pretty much just gym class or maybe a few clubs here and there, but nothing competitive, nothing through the school. Um, I, I used to look for, through her yearbook and there was just nothing for girls and, and um, for boys. There were all the you know team pictures of football and basketball. And, and uh, it was just amazing to me, the lack of opportunities for girls. Um, and, you know, she would have been a great athlete, I think. She um, loves the game of volleyball. She's uh, pretty athletic. And um, I, I always feel bad that she never had the opportunities that I did. And when Title IX was passed, it really just opened up funding and opportunities uh, for girls in sports. Um, 
in school, um, grade school, middle school, high school, and college, um, and just really kind of leveled the playing field, made things more equal, and it gave girls like me an opportunity to get way more involved in sports than, than our mothers were. Yeah, so being a Title IX baby, I love that. <laughs> so your mom, you're saying, and it's, it's crazy to me to think about how far we've come with this, because I can't imagine going to school, not having some right. of the same opportunities or scholarship opportunities and that kind of thing. So your mom, when she went to school, they didn't really have basketball for women. No, they were cheerleaders and that's it. Wow. Yeah. She said that she played um, volleyball a little bit in gym class, which is how she got to like volleyball, but she never got to really do anything more with it other than just to play in gym. And that was it. So then when this passed, did you have any like still needing to prove yourself or was it just like you can try out for the team now you can do this like all this the floodgates opened for women yeah well it was passed in 72 when i was born so by the time i was in you know middle school high school things were pretty well established. I mean, by that time, there uh, were national championships for women at the college level. And so um, I, I really didn't know anything differently. You know, there were already teams set up. I could try out. Um, there were, uh, you know, teams even in, in grade school, like a feeder system. And so yeah, there was nothing else that I knew besides that. And um, I just always wonder, like now thinking back on it as an adult, like how my mom must have seen that because that was such a different world for her. She didn't have that at all, but yet oh, there were all these opportunities available for her daughter. And then like a whole nother world opened up to me and, and my parents when I actually kind of became kind of good at basketball and started getting recruited and just this whole world of college athletics where it's it's taken very seriously and it's very competitive and there's money involved and there's scholarships involved. I mean, it just blew my parents' <laughs> mind that this was even out there. That is crazy. I bet they were just like, wow, how far we've come <laughs> right. again. Yeah. Yes. Especially my mom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and especially looking back. So does she ever share stories that she wishes she would have had that opportunity? Yeah, absolutely. I think that she kind of lived vicariously through me and, and my career because uh, she just didn't have those uh, uh, opportunities. But um, I, I think that she's very proud. And uh, I, I think that if she could have done it all over again, she would have loved to have had uh, the same opportunities to play sports and everything. Because I think she also saw that for me, it not only um, gave me the chance to go to college um, on a scholarship, I went to Northwestern. Which but huge. Which, yeah, which uh -huh. was huge. Um, but uh, it really changed me as a person. You know, Before I started playing sports, I was very shy. I was always the tallest person in my school. When I was in sixth grade, I was taller than even the principal. I mean, everyone, all the boys, all the girls, the teachers, I'm the principal. envious right now. <laughs> <laughs> I was about six feet as a sixth grader. Um, and I'm, I'm six, three now. So, uh, you know, but I was, I was super tall and, with that, you think that, oh, that's super, that's cool, and, and that's great for sports, but when you're like a middle school preteen uh, girl, it's horrible, right. and um, it just made me even more shy and, and, and kind of made me uh, fall more into a shell, and I, I remember I would walk with kind of rounded shoulders with not very good mm -hmm. posture because I wanted to fit in and be just, you know, like a normal girl, a normal right. sized girl. But when I started getting good at sports, it just gave me so much more confidence. I started to carry myself differently. I um, appreciated my height. I liked my height. I wanted to be even taller. Wow. I sat up straighter, carried myself um, better. And I just think that my mom recognized too how much sports did for me as a person and as uh, for self-esteem and confidence and everything. And I think that she appreciates that almost more than just the opportunity to play in and of itself. And it's still impacting your life today as you are yeah. a sports columnist. I am. Yeah. Yes. I stayed in sports. I, I did want to do that. And, and, and that's, you know, just where I'm seeing the opportunities change now for my own daughter, because when I got out of um, college sports, there really wasn't anywhere for us to go. That was pretty much it. That, that was like the cap. You, you know, graduated from college and, and maybe, you know, a few people would go over to Europe, but those leagues weren't as uh, well established as they are now for women's sports and women, women's basketball. But um, now, you know, you can play in the WNBA and there are right. careers there for women and all kinds of careers in, in sports administration and things like that for for girls and that's where I'm seeing like it extend for, for my daughter so when I got out the best thing to do was to go into sports journalism mm -hmm. so I became a sports writer that is awesome yeah. well I I have to say I'm I mean it might sound funny to say I champion your first generation <laughs> story thank you but seriously like you're like doing it yeah so thank you so much for coming on you're and sharing welcome. your story thank you from immigrants to graduates our first generation guests didn't let the struggle stop them they have made history for themselves and others that will follow. We'd love to hear your first generation moments, so make sure to share those with us on social. 
For more information on today's show, visit WhitneyReynolds.com. Go beyond the interview with Whitney Reynolds in her 52-week guide of inspiration. The book goes deeper with the stories you see on the Whitney Reynolds Show. To order your copy for $12.95 plus shipping and handling, go to WhitneyReynolds.com backslash store and use code PBS. The Whitney Reynolds Show is supported by the Illinois chapter of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, whose mission is to save lives and bring hope to those affected by suicide. Children's Learning Place, excellence in early childhood education since 1998. Evolve Her, a collaborative workspace for women. Kevin Kelly with Jameson Sotheby's International Realty. Luxury is an experience, not a price point. The Jay Parker, a Chicago rooftop restaurant at the Hotel Lincoln. And Hollis Plyman and Company, a Jacksonville CPA firm assisting individuals and businesses with financial success. Special thanks to Dr. Daftari and the team at Art of Modern Dentistry. Cellular Intelligence. Goldfish Swim Schools of Chicagoland, Deluxe Cleaning Services, Ega Salon and Spa, Chicago Andrea Creative, and Export Fitness.